Back by unpopular demand, it is I, your locally sourced farm to table certified rotten professor. I research topics by myself in a basement and tell them back to you in a way that I can only describe as revolutionary. So, uh, someone called Paul Revere. And you're welcome for that. To get this out of the way, I now have Invisalign on my bottom teeth, so uh, consider this video a lisp reveal. Also the word lisp, cruel and unusual punishment, way to kick people while they're down. Hello, I'm Gabriella, and this is Dumb Dumb Discussions, a web series where I do exactly what it sounds like. I take a topic that interests and confuses me, get to the meat and potatoes of it, and positively pop off like a girl boss by explaining it to both myself and you. So suit up, people, because we've got quite the topic today. Fighting! More specifically, why have we loved watching people beat the shit out of each other since the dawn of time? If there was a large group of people at any point in history, you can pretty much bet on there being some form of violent entertainment spectacle, and I want to know why that is. Are we really that sadistic? I mean, it would make sense with the way that history has panned out thus far, so who would really be shocked? And this video really isn't going to be delving into why people do fight, because that doesn't confuse me in the slightest. Looking at sports in general, putting time and effort into learning something, and seeing yourself get better and eventually master it makes perfect sense to me. Eventually master it? Bold words coming from someone who did five years of tennis and never got better. Not to mention that in a lot of situations, regardless of where you are in the world, fighting professionally or even as a hobby can earn you all sorts of things. Hope, pride, strength, protection, community, money, maybe a free rhinoplasty. The list goes on. Plus, fighting doesn't discriminate in terms of class, so no matter how much or how little you have to your name, you can still climb the ranks and be successful. And outside of the world of professional fighting, people are assholes, so the desire to serve them up a nice flame and hot knuckle sandwich isn't exactly something I've never considered. So this video isn't really shading the fighters, at least not all of them. I mean, come on. Like, really? It's shading the spectators, the voyeurs, you and I. We need to have a look at ourselves, because you can lie all you want, but in ancient Rome, you would have been in the Colosseum right along with everybody else, no matter how much you might morally oppose it now. Sometimes it hurts to look within. Speaking of the Colosseum, what a great place to start. Let's touch on it. Once upon a time, there was a very large and very powerful empire that loved nothing more than glory, conquest, and being wine drunk. That last one is still probably one of their favorite pastimes, the ancient Romans. That sounded like a really shitty panel show introduction, so. I mean, some may say I was born to host. You guys remember them, the ancient Romans, the ones that pretty much copied Greek mythology word for word, but really just had the nerve to change the gods' names and just keep it moving. Some people would call that plagiarism. I certainly would. One of their biggest DIY passion projects was a little thing called the Colosseum, an amphitheater that could accommodate anywhere between 50 and 80,000 people, depending on how generous they were feeling with their personal space. That's more than the Staples Center and Madison Square Garden combined, about the size of a stadium. The Colosseum is the most famous of many amphitheaters built all around the Roman Empire that were used to host gladiatorial games. Gladiators were basically boxers of the ancient world, if boxers had to spice things up and square up against a bear every few days, and also sometimes kill their opponents. But really, what did we expect from the ancient world logic? These are the same people who used urine to wash their clothes and tried to appoint a horse to the Senate. I mean, not that we haven't done something similar, pot kettle. These shows were so popular, they were even used as a political tool. And not in a money-making way. They were completely free to the public, sponsored by the aristocracy who paid to train fighters and supply all sorts of fun wildlife. Oh no, this was not about money. This was about optics. Knowing that a full house was standard, the emperor could make sure his people were always seeing him in a position of power over life and death a leader who would never shy away from punishment. And because of the overwhelming success of these shows, he could count on that message coming across loud and clear. Plus, because of the ancient world and their wholesome values, uh, this caused the emperor's approval rating to skyrocket. And just to get a taste of the levels of bloodthirst needed to assuage this crowd, I'm gonna go over the role of the Beastmaster. 
The Romans loved their exotic pets that they'd just fly first class right over to the Colosseum. Tigers, lions, bears, oh my, elephants, leopards, crocodiles. These guys were kind of like a halftime show. And the Beastmaster was charged with training them to be just about as feral as possible, going as far as beating them, starving them, and feeding them human remains to give them a hatred and taste for homo sapien meat. Then they would round up a bunch of criminals, which we now know probably means that most of them dared to look an aristocrat in the eye. Uh, the criminals would be tossed into the ring, most of the time without weapons, uh, where they would simply release the beasts upon them. But shocker, uh, sometimes the animals got a little spooked by the drunken hollering of 50,000 people and the bizarre setting that they'd found themselves in. So they would just kind of back away, don't be suspicious style. In which case the crowd would start booing because in their opinion, they have just been blue balled. So how was the crowd calmed? Uh, they would bring out the beast master, have him kneel on the ground and simply behead him. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, my friend. I mean, they fought each other with spiked brass knuckles. This was not friendly fire. These grotesque games went on for quite a while before Christianity really hit the stage and opposed them. And before you give them any credit and think how good of them to put a stop to this barbaric practice enough, you'll be shocked to find that it was because some of the rituals of the games referenced there being more than one God, which was a big no-no. Uh, forget the murderous violence and rampage. We don't like polytheism. So jot that down. Violence throughout history on a public stage is pretty much everywhere. If you have an extra hour and a tough stomach, might I interest you in researching the different methods of capital punishment that have been used? Ever heard of the guillotine? She might be making a reappearance sometime soon if some fucking changes aren't made, allegedly and in my opinion. Not getting put on a fucking list to die vibes. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Many cultures have practiced a form of human sacrifice in front of a large audience, either in the name of a deity, a harvest, or as an example to others thinking about dabbling in treason, AKA saying the king didn't look that handsome the other day. So I think I've proven my point when I say we've got a bit of a morbid fascination with watching people get hurt. Uh, did the gods really need the whole village to spectate? They told you that? Convenient, isn't it? Hey, I'll be the first to admit, if I'm watching a hockey game, I'm immediately more excited if two players fall face first into a knuckle buffet. I mean, it could have something to do with my lack of knowledge surrounding the game as a whole, but I like a sloppy showdown just as much as the next guy. So let me put my psych goggles on and do some digging and try to prove that I'm not a bad person. Maybe my brain is just like this. They do say the first stage of grief is denial, so. Right, bro. <laughs> First up, let's talk voyeurism. While it hasn't been studied too extensively, it's got high rates among most studied populations. A lot of people claim interest, and I'd even go as far as to say a lot more people have interests that aren't too keen on claiming it in a survey. And while yes, most of the time it is referencing the beast with two backs, why did I write that? Ew. I'd say we can liken it to fighting, because if you look at two things that are seen as explicit, you'll usually think of sex and violence. They're both accepted as a part of evolution and human nature, but they're definitely seen as bad for the eyes of the pure and innocent. But there are still billion dollar industries that bring them to the comfort of your own home. And what are you supposed to do? Not watch them? That's not very girl boss rise and grind of you. There are ads, previews, promoted tweets, where you're encouraged to watch them showing that while we might not think it's the right thing to view others doing, it doesn't mean we're not viewing it. Because isn't that the fun of it? It's something new and exciting, seen as a little taboo. You've probably heard references to not being allowed to engage in that sort of behavior. You know, if someone takes the low road, you take the high road. Well, most of us have seen the high road and it is boring. So let's watch the professionals take the low road and do everything you would have been expelled and sent to prison for. They get a fat paycheck while you'd be on probation. So is it not fun to indulge the fantasy if it's offered? And sure, the fantasy may be bloody and gross, but that also adds another layer to this. The science of tragedy. Ever pass a car crash? You look, right? If you say no, you're lying. And I think you need to unpack that because what are you trying to prove? Great, you just junked on someone with 34 YouTube subscribers. How does success taste? 
To all the honest watchers, that's totally normal. Your brain is collecting data, jotting down what types of misfortunes may come to you, and seeing how to avoid these boogeymen. It's a lot of survival instinct and confronting our biggest fears from our cocoons of safety and logic. You're not in the situation, so it's the perfect time to storyboard, brainstorm. Maybe make a Pinterest board on what you would do in this scenario. Okay, I see that a Mack truck seems to have lost control and hit several cars on the highway. I am now going to speed up every time I drive next to a Mack truck to pass it in order to protect me if that were to happen again. Also, if you don't speed up when you're driving next to a Mack truck anyway, I don't trust you because they're just... Leave me alone, you know? A lot of times when you listen to people talk about fights, you'll hear something like, oh, I never would have done that. They should have done this instead. Like, okay, Brett, glad to hear your very useful commentary from the couch. I'm sure Anthony Joshua was hanging on the edge of his seat waiting for Brett to chime in. Newsflash, a non-professional interested in sports gives his suggestion unprompted. Never seen that before. But in the defense of breaths all over the world, they're not actually suggesting that like a coach would. They're putting themselves in the scenario, plotting in the case they find themselves there. This is how men decide to exercise empathy. Are you kidding me? Every day I am this much closer to my Joker era. It's coming. So girl boss of me. And of course, it's much easy for all of us to pretend that it's that easy to plot it in hindsight. These are said to be similar feelings when you're looking through the glass of a line enclosure or standing on the rooftop of a skyscraper. You're confronted with this hypothetical terror in a controlled environment where you can just sit back, ask yourself some questions, and prepare. Normalize checking in with yourself. And babes, this isn't the Colosseum with 50,000 screaming spectators. You could not scare the lion into surrender. Unless, of course, you're a Sigma male, in which case, absolutely you can. It's it's just too easy. It's just too easy. Another layer that we can peel back is how we view sports in general. Fan mentality and parasocial camaraderie in the world of sports has been studied extensively and shown how truly dedicated our brains can be to something that we have no actual part in. Most fans even use the term we to describe how the team or even singular player is performing. If you're more curious about these parasocial relations, this video is sponsored by me, and I have a handy dandy video about PR where I talk about just that. So if you're sitting here watching this, maybe go watch that after. And subscribe while you're here. Maybe give a like on this video and a comment. I'll move on from the begging now. There are these neurons in our brains that mirror what we see, causing people to empathetically feel what a team is feeling as if they're a part of it especially if they've been rooting for them for a while. Your serotonin can rise and fall with the team, leading to intense anger and even depression if the team loses, similar to how the players on the team feel, and insane levels of satisfaction and euphoria if the team wins. And when you look at the empathy aspect in fighting, the person you're rooting for is very obviously in emotional and physical pain with every loss and even every win adding on to the hardship and therefore the joy that you feel on the way to their success. Like you've crossed the finish line with them or just finished. I mean, euphoria and satisfaction don't threaten me with a good time. And on the opposite side of the coin, ever heard of schadenfreude? Schadenfreude is a type of pleasure due to someone else's pain. And not in that way, perv. It's the high you get when you find out that something bad has happened to someone that you think deserves it. Maybe a sort of comeuppance, if you will. This is why everyone outside of New England usually roots for whatever team is not the Patriots during the Super Bowl. They like watching them lose, whether it's the ball inflation catastrophe, the sometimes insufferable fans, or just resentment that the team does win a lot. Everybody roots for the challengers. I mean, how else could we explain why anyone would want to watch a bunch of spoiled, cocky, controversial internet creators beat the shit out of each other in a ring? YouTubers versus TikTokers. Two people who have called each other some form of broke, ugly, or stupid entering a ring in a dick measuring contest isn't exactly a show of hard work and mastery, is it? Of course not. They or their managers know people don't like them and will pay very good money to watch them bleed all over a mat. 
Bryce Hall versus Austin McBroom, white celebrities versus personal hygiene, Jake Paul versus the FBI, Logan Paul versus Floyd Mayweather Jr. Was that some sort of a sick joke? A professional boxer who has never lost a fight in his career versus some guy who I guess goes to the gym a lot. If Logan Paul wasn't a controversial figure, that proposition would have been ignored if not spit on. But they knew people would pay good money to watch Logan Paul get his shit rocked. Because come on, it was never a question of Logan Paul was going to win. It was a question of what round he'd get knocked out in. And the fact that he didn't get knocked out. I am going to mind my own business, but something allegedly isn't adding up, allegedly. And Twitter was mad about that too. They were ready for their bloodbath. Because really, what are we if not animals? Are we not simply just searching to find a hierarchy like all the other mammals? Speaking of which, mammals in general, pretty dramatic if you couldn't tell. Why else would National Geographic have so much material? And the fight for dominance fuels most of that drama. Whether it's for mates, protection, food, shelter, or just good old fashioned, he looked at me funny. In all sorts of animals, there have been links between testosterone levels and aggression. So it looks like we can all be hormonal, not just women who won't smile at you on the street. Castration has actually been shown to heavily reduce aggression, so just an idea for any world leaders out there. I mean, it would help them to deal with all those distracting emotions that just always stand in the way of their logic. It's even been reported that when certain animals lose a fight, their testosterone levels actually lower and the winners rise, helping to hormonally change that hierarchy. Your hormones are saying, shut the fuck up and quit while you're ahead, please. I wish more people would take the advice. And looking at the animal kingdom's obsession with dominance, I would say we're not too far off. I mean, every other week, someone's very publicly testing nuclear weapons in a hopefully hollow threat because I know no one can drop any or everybody else is going to drop one and we will all die. Uh, maybe we should normalize cat. Mm. You know what? I'm not going to say that or I'll end up on a list, but let's just say it was a callback to a previous suggestion that may have been brought forward. I mean, think about it. All of the most popular sports in the world are men's sports where they dominate each other mentally, physically, and emotionally in front of audiences mostly made up of men screaming, crying, and getting drunk. At least when animals do this, they don't have to pay for tickets to it. And we think we're the smart ones. And another thing that I think needs to be touched on is who writes history and how that affects us long term. And hear me out. I know this is getting a little bit too deep and maybe it's full of shit, but I want to talk about colonization and the atrocities that have shaped the way that we see glory. Going all the way back to that Colosseum in the ancient world, fighting was seen as this quintessential act of greatness. You were looking death in the face and overcoming it. This macho persona, the gladiator, all the men wanted to be him and all the women wanted him to be in them. The Roman Empire expanded quickly and by force, and victors make trends. Many cultures that were doing fine with just trading and hunting, gathering, and community were now being shipped off into slavery and cage matches, where the only way to freedom was fighting for so-called glory. Being brutal and cruel were now things that were being taught in the name of civilization. The colonization of the Americas, where European values were thrust upon natives by one of the most evil people to ever exist, who is still a bank holiday, which makes me want to kill myself. Uh, I mean, they were so barbaric, what with those bows and arrows and spears, so here's a firearm. Much more civilized. They brought the Middle Ages over and made it everybody's problem where they were all obsessed with jousting, war, and public execution, but in the name of God, so it was fine. The topics of war and glory have gone hand in hand a lot throughout history, with words like conquer and crusade being used. We learn the most about the ones who take the most and write their names in blood. So it would only make sense that people see value and strength in violent actions. And what's a more controlled, safe way for people to watch and insert themselves than boxing? or even just a world star video on Twitter. Either way, you're not in danger. You're just along for the ride. Your animal brain gets pet, while well, you get a nice boost of serotonin. Your mind places itself right into a first round knockout. Congrats, winner. It feels like you've been through battle without any of those pesky scars. You get to watch something new and dangerous with twists and turns along the way while keeping all of your own teeth. As Hannah Montana would say, it's the best of both worlds. 
Also, just a little personal thing I wanted to add that I thought was interesting. And this is not based on a large sample size, nor is it scientific. It's just something that I noticed. When I ask people about watching fights, some people, mainly men, seem to get excited talking about it because they put themselves in the shoes of the winner. Whereas others, mainly women, tended to feel uneasy about watching them because they seemingly put themselves in the shoes of the loser. And I don't have anything to say about that. I just thought it was interesting to see the different ways that the empathy can work. Well, that wraps that up. I hope this lecture, AKA a mixture of research and my own personal suspicions, finds you well. But I know we're still in a global pandemic, so it probably won't. Fuck this, am I right? And get vaccinated. It's a dark day when I have to agree with something that Meghan McCain has said. I, I do trust science, I trust doctors, and quite frankly, I'd let them put an iPod Nano between my shoulder blades if it means I can get drunk at Caesar's Palace again. It is diabolical at this point and simply cannot happen again. Jesus. Anyway, thank you so much for spending a precious chunk of your day with me. I really appreciate it. And leave a comment down below if you think of any topics you'd like dumbed down so that we can discuss them. And I mean we in the sports way, so just me. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go watch a very highly anticipated fight between James Corden's crotch and the window of a Honda Civic. And the bell doesn't dismiss you, I do. So class, dismiss.